Praise the Lord. If you got your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to again start reading in verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. And we've dealt with the foundation of the world. That, that world, there's two applications. The first application that I'll use is Jesus ended the old religious order. The word world means orderly arrangement of things. Jesus ended that old religious system. He ended the need for animal sacrifice. He ended the dispensation of the law. But how many know that Adam also brought forth the foundation of a world? The word foundation there meaning the overthrow of a world and the, and the laying down of a foundation. Adam overthrew what God had established in him plunged the world into darkness plunged the world into sin and that became the foundation of the world until Jesus came and how many when Jesus came he overthrew that world and established a new one. And we dealt with the seven days of creation last week. But I want to go on into verse 26 here. So for then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, somebody say now. Once in the end of the world. Hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In our religious upbringing, most of our traditional understanding is we're ready for the end of the world. We've heard it preached all of our life. Every generation has made their predictions as to when the end of the world is going to come. Amen? Amen. Now, our understand, the religious understanding of that has changed from generation to generation as more truth has been revealed and they have to deal with what Scripture actually talks about. When I, when I first came to know the Lord and, and the first things that I heard was, you know, was Jesus is coming at any moment to get us out of here because the world's going to come to an end. And, my, and the concept was, you know, you got the seven years great tribulation and then the place is going to go up in flames. But then you got a problem because in Revelation chapter 20, you've got a millennium. Which if you take it literally, there's a thousand years after all this is supposed to happen. And it's supposed to happen on earth. So then... Doctrine got changed a little bit. Theology got changed a little bit. Well, we're going to go up in the rapture. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation when all hell's going to break loose on earth, but then we're going to come back. Or the Jews, we're going to, or we're going to stay in heaven, and the Jews are going to rule the world. Well, that's a step in the right direction. At least we know the planet's going to survive. Can somebody say amen? Now, then us kingdom people get a little bit further revelation, understanding. And so we know that we're not going to go anywhere. We know that we're going to rule and reign with Christ. But we still have, the, and we got the revelation that the word world there is age. Because when you look into the king, uh, look into the, the original Greek word there for, for, for the King James word world, it's aeon. 
which is age. So we got the revelation that it ain't about the planet. It's about an age is coming to an end. And so we be and so we started preaching about the end of the age. But now we come to this scripture and we find out that the end of the age ended at Calvary. Not way out here somewhere. And all the time we've been looking for the kingdom age, guess what we've had? We've had the kingdom age, but we've not done anything with it. It's been there, but it's just sat idle because the people have never applied it, believed it, and put it into operation. Because you see, we're waiting for one day for this thing to happen. Oh, we don't have a rapture anymore, but we're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. One glad morning, we're just going to instantaneously change. We're going to have no more problems, and we're just going to be perfect. Now, two generations of kingdom folk that's had this revelation have started going to the grave. All of us have been preaching immortality and that's a true message. But we've been going to, because we've been waiting for it. Waiting for it. One day. And the longer we wait and put it off, guess what? Another generation is going to happen. Somebody has got to begin to put these things into operation. What Jesus has done. We have been in the kingdom age. And there have been individuals that have tapped in to just a little bit of it. Can somebody say amen? But God in his sovereignty knows when a people are going to get a hold of this thing. And manifest it. But you know what us predestination folk have been doing? Nothing. Because it's all predestinated. Come on. Well you know when God's ready it's going to happen. Well God ain't going to be. God's already ready. And it ain't going to happen until you're ready. You know. I believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. And I believe he has predestinated everything. But let me tell you something. We don't know when everything's going to happen. And let me tell you something. God did not make you make the wrong choices that you've made. Now God will use them. For your benefit, if you love him. For all things work together for the good to them that love God. And them that are called according to his purpose. It did not say everything. all things work together for the good for everybody. Because all things do not work together for good if your attitude is in rebellion against God. Everything does not work for your advantage until you have the right attitude, the right mind, till you love God. And we're all called according to His purpose. But honey, until we get to the place till we love God, all things don't work together. How many know? How many know? Same thing can happen to one person, happen to another. It'll, t it'll bring one person closer to God. And the other one, he'll drive him farther away. All happens to be whether the person loves God or not. Because if you love God and something happens to you that you don't understand, you still trust God. And uh, 
one thing that has never worked for me is getting mad at God. Now I know there 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 there, 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 are, there, there are preachers that, that have and, and and do occasionally. You know, there's there's the movie The Apostle. You know, where where you know he's up there yelling at God and saying, "I can't hear you." Speak to me, God. Well, you know, you start yelling at God, and I'm sure you're not going to get the get the uh, answer you want to hear. And uh, Bishop. Parson even accused me one time of getting him that movie because I was uh, getting on his case. <laughs> Testified, I don't know how many times he said, I just got him the movie. I just let him watch the movie. He took all that on himself. <laughs> you know, but I've seen those who have gotten mad at God and, well, I tried it once. And it just didn't work. But it's not in my nature to do that. Not the person that I am. And so even though I don't understand situations, I can't do anything else but trust God. And when you love God and you trust God, all things work together for your good. Even your mistakes. Even where you have fallen short. God will use them for your benefit. You'll learn from them. However, that does not mean all things are good. All things work together for good. There's a difference. If you make a bad decision, and you go against his will, and you do something contrary to his nature, how many know it ain't a good thing? But if your heart's right, it can work for your good. And God never makes you do something that's wrong. Amen? But yet, how many of us have heard predestination preachers, you know, justify all kinds of things because, well, you know, was, I had to do that to learn. You know, You know, we didn't have to come the way we did. I didn't have to spend 17 years of my life a mess. Now, my mother had her problems, but, you know, she sent me to Sunday school down to the little church down the road. And periodically, some of that took. But then, as I grew older, you know, I wanted to do things my way or so I thought and get into all the trouble that I got into how many know that wasn't predestinated by God now God used it for my benefit and he knew I was going to get into that trouble see we forget something we're predestinated according to his foreknowledge he knows the goof ups you're going to make so he will use those goof ups for your good if your heart's right. And sometimes you've got to experience a little bit of the evil. By that I mean calamity. You've got to reap some of the result of your actions before you start getting your heart right and before they start, all things start working together for good. Lord, how on earth did I get into all that? Except for to say this, God in his sovereignty knows when a people are going to finally put into operation all that he has provided for us by his death, burial, and resurrection on Calvary's cross. And we will begin to rule and reign and make a difference in this earth. But we are in the kingdom age. It didn't start in 2000. It started at the resurrection of Christ. The end of the age, according to this scripture. How many believe this scripture? 
If we believe this scripture, then all this nonsense that we have believed about the end of the world and the end of the age, we need to put behind us because the end of the age happened at Calvary. But now once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Listen to verse 27. Before I read verse 27, let me again give you our past traditional understanding of the judgment of the world. After the world comes to an end. After it's all said and done, how many know we're all going to be gathered together at the throne room? We're going to stand in this long line to be judged. Well, if it is, you're, you're first in line. And there you know the book's going to be brought out. And if you've not got your name written in that book, how many know there's an there, 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 there's a, 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 a elevator there that's going to take you straight to hell? Maybe. Now, all that's there in Revelations 20, but how many know that's all spiritual language? Language that you will know if you've read the whole book and allowed the Holy Spirit to bring scriptures to your remembrance, comparing scripture with scripture, letting the Bible interpret the Bible. You'll find out, honey, we're in the judgment of God right now. But that's the traditional idea, you know, the end, uh, uh, rapture's going to take place, great tribulation's going to take place, end of the world's going to come, then we're all going to be gathered around this great white throne, all billions and billions and billions of us, waiting for our name to be called where we come before the judge. If our name's in the book, we get to go past the pearly gates into heaven. St. Peter himself will escort us. If not, the elevator's there to take us straight down. And then that's it. You Either heaven or hell, you've made your choice. But I want to tell you what the Bible says about the judgment of the world. Verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die... But after this, the judgment. So every funeral we go to, or we'll hear preachers say, it's appointed unto men once to die. One thing's for certain, you're going to die. That's not the Bible message. The Bible message is we're going to live. We're going to live. But as long as we believe we're going to die, guess what we're going to, what's going to happen? We're going to die. Somebody is going to believe they can live, and they're going to live. Not just spiritually. Thank God that there is no such thing as death for someone that is born again. Amen? Actually, there's no death for anyone. Because there's just those that know they're redeemed and those that don't know they're redeemed. Those that don't know they're redeemed remain in darkness. Can somebody say amen? And how many of that's hell? That's hell. We're not doing away with hell. If you're in darkness, you're in hell. But how many know you can't you don't have to stay in that darkness? You don't have to stay in that darkness. When light comes in, when truth comes in, and you begin to comprehend it, how many know you can leave the darkness and come into the light? Because you have been redeemed. It's just like 
somebody, and I know that we use this illustration a lot, but it's true. If somebody deposits a million dollars in your bank account, but you don't believe it and you don't know it, you can still live in poverty. And somebody tells you, well, now, wait a minute. You got a million dollars in your account. I see it, 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 it's, it's there. It's been, but oh, yeah. You. And as long as you remain in unbelief, guess what? You'll live in poverty. You won't pay your bills. You'll barely get by all the time. What you need's right there. That's the way it is. What Jesus did, he provided. Everybody has it. It's in their account. But it's through preaching, people begin to find out what they have. And if they don't believe what they have, how many know they won't use what they have? Oh, praise the Lord. And so we keep hearing, we have to die. When Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, we shall not all sleep. Amen? Isn't that in there? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be made a lot changed. We shall all be changed. Oh, praise the Lord. But still today, People preach, and it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Let me tell you when it was appointed unto men once to die. When God said to Adam, In the day ye eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Adam disobeyed God, ate of that tree, how many of it was appointed unto man once to die? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Amen? And so, because of that, death has reigned on all humanity. Amen? But here is the judgment of the world. It says, but after this, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. See, it was appointed unto men once to die back there in 4004 B.C. When Adam sinned, and God couldn't go back on his word. But turn with me to John chapter 12. And I know I've read these scriptures before. I've quoted them before. But we need to get these scriptures drummed in our head because the Bible tells us plainly when the judgment of the world is. And it ain't out here somewhere, honey. It ain't in the future. It happened at Calvary's cross. John chapter 12, verse 31. How many are there? Verse 30 said, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now. Somebody say now. Now. When did Jesus say that? 2,000 years ago. So now, to him was 2,000 years ago. Now is the judgment of this age, this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Man, we're waiting for the devil to be dethroned when he's already been dethroned. It's through our ignorance. It's through our unbelief that that devil's allowed to exist. But he has no authority. He has been cast out. He is under our feet. There is no big bad devil anymore if we walk according to the word of God. Now, if we want to look at circumstances, come on, if we want to walk away, things appear to be, and, and, and deny what the Word of God says, honey, then there's a devil. He 
He'll rule in your unbelief. He'll rule in your ignorance. But honey, he was cast out at Calvary. Isn't that what it says? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, talking about him being lifted up on Calvary's cross, will draw a portion of humanity unto me. Man, these scriptures are so plain. How many know God's big enough to do exactly what he says? Now you can remain in darkness as long as you want to. But sooner or later, all men are going to see the light. But how many know it's more beneficial to us the sooner we start seeing it? Because there's a lot of loss we do not have to suffer. The longer you wait, the longer you stay in darkness, how many know the longer you're going to suffer loss? And your loss is going to get greater and greater and greater. And I don't know about you, I've suffered all the loss I want to suffer. Amen? Oh, praise the Lord. But this is what he says. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This is the judgment. Let me go over here. Back to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 28. How many know follows verse 27? And it is appointed unto men once to die. Verse 27. But after this the judgment. So... How many know so is connected in this verse with the previous verse? So, because of this, this is in force. So, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And the many there simply means more than one. The many we know to be all. Can somebody say amen? Because he already said, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. But how many know all is many? Anything above one is many. What he did, he did for many. Amen? Is that, that's not too hard to understand, is it? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto deliverance. Now this is a part I like. Because you know where he's talking about appearing at? In you. In you. In you, he's going to appear the second time, only this time without sin. When Christ, who is our life, Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life. Somebody say, Christ is my life. If he is your life, how many know, when you start seeing the real person you are, is without sin. I'm not talking about what you yield your members over to. We still occasionally have... I don't like to put, put it because we can, from this point, never sin again. We have the choice and we have the ability. From this point, we don't have to sin at all. Come on, we have the, we have the ability to live above temper tantrums. We have the ability to be patient with one another. We have the ability to forgive one another. We have the ability to resist temptation. We have that ability. But there are still times we have 
Come on, I want to keep this in the past. Because from this point on, you may never sin again. If you do, all hope's not gone. You have an advocate with the Father. You have forgiveness. But I don't want to give any occasion to the flesh. We have the ability to be in control. And let me tell you something. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Once we believe what he has done for us, honey, we are heaven bound. But my hope isn't to die and go to heaven. I can live any old way I want to and die and go to heaven. But then when I go to heaven, I'm going to have to learn a whole lot. Come on, come on, come on. I mean, you know, we can't fathom everything there is. You know, people hear a lot of the things we say, well, they, you know, there's no judgment for, for, for doing wrong. Oh, yes, there is. You know, you're, you'll, you'll go to heaven. You'll, be, you'll go on to be with the Lord. But, honey, you got what you don't learn here, you're going to have to learn over there. You're going to have to learn. Oh, praise the Lord. This is, I don't know how far I'm going to get this morning. I hope you're getting something out of this. But we have the ability. But we have yielded our members over to other things. But how many know the real person we are no longer wants to live in that dimension? There is no sin in him. There is no sin in the real person we are. But that doesn't mean that we're, the, 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 that doesn't matter. Because he says, to whomsoever we yield our members over to, we put, become its servants. And as long as we yield our members over to sin, how many know death still works in the body? See, putting on immortality really is simple. When sin no longer has any control in your life, death cannot operate. So if we're still, if death is still working in us, the aging process and everything's going on, guess what still has some power in us? Come on, it's just, it's just plain and simple. Now, does that separate us from God? No. But how many know we've been given this body to possess? We can live without being sick. We can live without dying. We don't have to go to the other side. Everybody on that side is waiting for us to, to, to get it together down here so they can manifest themselves with us here. Everybody's wanting to go up there for the great reunion. The reunion ain't up there. The reunion's here. When heaven and earth become one unit again, as it was in the beginning. In the beginning was the heaven and the earth. They were one unit there. Sin separated heaven from earth. But Revelation 21 says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. My God. So when Christ died on Calvary's cross, that was the judgment of the world. He paid the price. Price being paid, the debt is canceled. But how many know we got to get a hold of what he has done? Amen. Listen, I'm just going to read some scriptures we all know. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, talking about the judgment of the world. The judgment of the world happened at Calvary. But we got to identify and believe what happened at Calvary and start applying it in our life. 
we got to start cashing them checks and using that money that's been deposited in our account. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. I normally quote it. I'm going to read it today. I better get there. I'm in 1 Corinthians. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all then we're all dead. It is appointed unto man once to die but then the judgment. When Jesus died how many know all were dead? In that he died for all when he died all were dead. Somebody said the appointment was made. The appointment was made. Amen. Now it goes on to say in verse 15. It says and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. But unto him which died for them and rose again. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. And I believe verse 14. Might be verse 9. I don't know. We'll have to get there and see. These are some scriptures you need in your arsenal against the thoughts of the enemy. I'm going to start reading in uh, verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. If Jesus tasted death for every man, how many know the appointment was made? All have died. But that's talking about more than just the forgiveness of our sins. Romans 6.6 6 tells us what it is. Again, most of the time, I just quote these scriptures. I want to read them today. In fact, let me just start reading in verse 1. Romans chapter 6. What shall we... What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Turn around and neighbor and say, I'm a new man. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin oh hallelujah when Jesus died your old man died the new man the one that's born of God doth not commit sin the real you is not a sinner. That was accomplished at Calvary's cross. Our old man. Everybody's old man. Now I say that, but you need to think about this a moment. I'm telling you, the child molester, the murderer, the liar, the thief, that, that old man was crucified. But you see, they aren't aware of it. They are still living, being deceived.
because they're deceived. They don't, they don't know who they are. But what Jesus did, he did for everyone. But it takes the preaching of the word for people to understand what has been, been done. Through the foolishness of preaching. How can they know unless they hear? But first of all, we got to get the Christians to hear. Because they think their old man's still around. And so they're constantly trying to die to something that the Bible said he's already killed. And because we're trying to do what he's already done, we're not having any success. If you deny him, how many know what he says? He'll deny you. You got to start seeing you are different. The flesh is the flesh. But how many know you're not the flesh? The flesh is a part of you. But it isn't you. And the flesh has certain impulses, certain appetites, certain things that's involved there. If left to themselves, how many know are evil. But if you rule over them, hello, if you rule over them, they're no longer evil. But because nobody knows who they are until the truth comes to them and they don't have a relationship with God, they're not aware of anything else in them except for what they appear to be, the flesh. Is everybody understanding this? So they're deceived by what they appear to be. And most Christians, even those that believe this message, have this revelation, still don't believe everything because the Bible says, as he is, so are we. What, we. what we really desire is what he desires. Now let me break this down. How many know Jesus isn't a drunkard? Nowhere in the Bible can you find him where he was drunk. Because the Bible says God hates drunkenness. Now he may have drank. But that's not clear. Do you know why Jesus was called a wine bibber? Because he associated with them. Now he may have drank. He may have not drinking. But one thing I can tell you, it didn't control him. He controlled it. I can tell you one thing. Jesus didn't have a need for a buzz. Didn't have a need for a buzz. That's exactly right. Do you know what the buzz is? The buzz is a counterfeit for the anointing. I drank and got stoned and did everything I did when I was a kid in searching for what I have right now. How many will... When you, when you begin to worship and praise the Lord... When, thought, when, when, when you begin to, thoughts come into your mind that you recognize as his voice. When God's using you, isn't there a high there? Not like the one in the world. Not one that causes you to lose control. But one that actually causes you to be in control. But come on, it feels good. 
You can feel the presence of the Lord. We don't walk by feelings, but how many know you can feel his presence? That's why when you read this scripture, when he says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Because being drunk with wine, that is a counterfeit to being filled with the Spirit. And see, what happens is with the other and this is why Jesus never did that, is you start losing control. And when you lose control, honey, something else comes in and takes control. That's why Paul said, yeah, all things are lawful for me, but not everything is to my best advantage, which is what the Greek word, we you know, because we don't know what expedient means, most of us, but you look it up. It's not to our best advantage. And I will not be brought underneath the power of any. And how many know there's all kinds of addictive behavior that comes in and tries to control us? And it's not to our advantage. But I'll tell you what. How many have ever... You don't... Nobody raise your hands. I don't, I don't want you to tell me. Just think about it. But how many, at one point in your life, you know, started lying? And when you did... Pretty soon you got to the point where you couldn't, yeah, it started controlling you to where you would lie when it actually was not to your advantage. Well, I could make some comments about President Clinton on this, but... I did not have sexual relationship with that woman. I smoked dope once, but I didn't inhale. Yeah, but I mean, those were some pretty obvious lies. I mean, it would have been better to say, I smoked dope at that and leave it at that. <laughs> I mean, because I mean, nobody believed that. You know, but well, I'm using that as an illustration. You get into, you get into that habit, and pretty soon, you're actually lying when you don't even want to lie. It becomes an addictive behavior, flying off the handle. Come on, that becomes an addictive behavior. And how many know it can control your life? And you'll get, you'll fly off the handle when you don't want to fly off the handle. Come on, any, and I've done it. You start letting that get a hold of your life. Boy, preacher, you're, you're meddling now. See, there's all kinds of addictive behavior. And it's like, you, you may choose to do it because you think you want to do it, but then after a while, you become a prisoner to it. And my, there's so much addictive things to be addicted to. Man, there's, we think of drugs and alcohol and cigarettes, but my, there's all kinds of things to be addicted to. But Paul said, I will not be brought underneath the power of any. But until you are aware that there's more to you than what you appear to be, how many know you're powerless against it? But he says, he says, your old man is crucified. 
But listen. He goes on to say in verse 11. Likewise. Well let me just read, read on here. Verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. i got a few minutes. I better bring this to an end. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Somebody say, that's talking about now, not one day in the future. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And how many know what that word reckon means? It's the same word, it's the same idea. How, how many know, how many got a checking account? What do you get every month? And what must you do with your checkbook? Reconcile it or reckon it to the statement. The statement is our old man is crucified. We then got to reckon. Come on. Believe it. Believe it. Reckon it. And when we reckon it, then it starts working. Now, that's a very simple thing to say. But what, what's it look like? He says, as he is, so are we in this world. What we really desire is what he desires. And how many are starting to see that? But how many know it's a progress to believe it? There are still things in our lives that we still believe is us that isn't. And unfortunately, this is where all things work together for our good if we love God. Unfortunately, we've got to learn that a lot of the things we think we want we really don't. And some of the things that we think we really don't want to do, we find out we really do. How many know, how many, there's, there's people that we just have in the past, just didn't want to forgive. But really inside the real you did want to forgive. But you didn't want to let go of that that was in your head. But how many know through process of time and wrong things working in your life because you're holding on to that, finally you come to the realization you really do want to forgive them. Bring this thing to an end. Bottom line. Jesus ended a world at Calvary. He ended an age. How many know the definition of an age is a period of time in which an event uh, has taken place or, or rules. How many know that the present evil age that ended at Calvary, what, that was the age of sin and death. That was the age of the law of sin and death. The law showed us that in our own strength, we could not measure up. And death reigned. Amen. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. And through the law, death reigned unto Christ. Amen. But when Jesus came, he ended that world. But yet, to this day, physically, and even in some people's minds spiritually, death still has been reigning. Because we have not all reckoned what he says of the, the, that our old man is crucified. That we are a new person. So until we begin to completely believe what he says about us. And begin to discover that what we want isn't always what the flesh wants. But that what we want is what he wants. How I mean, Until we come to that point, how many know we still live in the world Jesus ended. But how many know that when we begin to reckon true what he has done, then how many know that's when we begin to experience that that world that he ended, ended. Last scripture, 
Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is a new thought to me. That is, it's a recent thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 11, I believe it is. No, it's, it's 10 verse 11. That's what I'm wanting. Let me read up just a few verses. Let me start reading in uh, verse 4 and get the context. I, verse 2. And we're all baptized unto Moses. Well, I'm just going to start reading verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All did eat the same spiritual meat all, and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three, th three, th three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured. Somebody say complain. And were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for our examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends, plural, of the world are come. We need to be convinced above all shadow of a doubt that, the, that what we really want is what he wants. That his will, as described in this book, is a mirror of what we really want. And how many are beginning to discover that? And as we discover that, we're beginning to understand the old us really is dead. And as we do, how many know we're coming to the end of ourself?